We are happy to welcome the award-winning author David Bodanis as our next guest. David is a captivating speaker and, over the years, has taken on many roles, including that of a social science academic at the University of Oxford, a consultant and a writer. He writes on topics ranging from politics, science and business to management. His latest book, The Art of Fairness, The Power of Decency in a World Gone Mean, published in 2020 in the UK, continues to garner widespread praise. On compliance, David says, society depends on compliance and a belief that we need to aim towards ethical business. David, fantastic to have you here in the studio. I've read your book and um, I really liked it. And one of the first things that struck me is how very emotional it kicks off. You have great examples at the beginning, sort of life and death situations in the airplane that's about to crash and also in a surgery that's gone wrong. I would like to hear first, what sparked the idea, what gave you the inspiration to write this book on this topic and now and this timing as well? The, the timing I, I would like to take uh, credit for, but um, the need to be, uh, to be decent. Uh, the need to be decent because there's a lot of people who aren't being decent. And you want to, uh, you wonder, can it work? As our previous speaker said, Machiavelli, Machiavelli said, it's better to be feared than to be loved. And many people quote that, but it turns out Machiavelli himself had a terrible career. He was writing all these books, he was uh, in exile. The Medici had uh, kicked him out of Florence. He had failed totally in his career. So his principle that it's better to be feared than loved isn't always true. The idea for the book began when I was at another conference years ago in uh, California. And there was one person there who shall remain nameless, who is a big deal on Wall Street. And we were, I was a speaker, he was a speaker, very rich man. And he was a horrible human being. He was polite when he was giving his talk, but off stage he was rude to everybody, and in his business he was a very sharp dealer. Uh, he was arrogant. I remember there was a young woman who was doing a PhD uh, at Columbia on uh, uh, his field, and she was going to ask him a question, and he just sneered at her and said these horrible things. At the same conference, there was uh, John Warnock who created uh, Adobe Photo Systems. If you've ever used a PDF, that's John Warnock's uh, uh, development. Warnock was the head of uh, Adobe, uh, I think a billionaire, a very rich man, and he was a really decent guy. He wasn't a softy. If you're too soft, if you're merely nice, that doesn't work very well. But he was in the audience. If he had bodyguards, they were well hidden. You didn't see them. He wasn't arrogant. He was polite to people who came up with him. And it made me think, you know what? There's two ways to get to the top. You can be like that guy from Wall Street uh, who was just a nasty piece of work, or you can be like Mr. Warnock, who was actually even more successful. So I thought, how did he do it? I wanted to find out. Okay, thank you. Um, the second part of the title is The Power of Decency in a World Turned Mean. So would you say that the world is becoming meaner? And if so, could you give us some examples from the book? Uh, sure. Um, well, I suppose the world is becoming meaner not because human beings have become worse, but because our, our outlets allow that. So um, sometimes, you know, uh, you would see somebody do something in public and you would grumble to yourself, grumble, grumble, grumble. Nowadays, you can express that grumble on social media and you can get other people grumbling along with you. So some of the negative views that people always had privately can now be manifest more publicly. So we see a sort of anger in politics, the sort of rise of populism in many countries, uh, autocracy and stuff. Uh, uh, I live in England, though as you can tell uh, from my American accent, um, I, I had a president uh, recently who is not known as the nicest person on earth. Even his supporters would say that. And there's a sort of a, a, a pleasure many people get in, in being a little bit brutal and violent. Um, uh, teenage boys love, uh, many of them, will, will bully somebody who doesn't fit. And that seems cruel to the outsider, but from the inside, there's a community in that. So gangs are scary to people outside them, but inside there's a real uh, support and camaraderie. So how can you break from that? How can you be decent and still successful? How can you get that, that warmth and connection? So that's what I talk about in some of those stories that you mentioned. 
Okay. Would you say then, because the, the things that some of the things you describe are, you know, human vices that have always existed, but is one of the things that you're saying that a certain new technology or when new technologies arise, that breeds more meanness and unfairness? I think what happens whenever there's a new technology, it's kind of uneven. So uh, newspapers, for example, at the moment, uh, if I say something uh, uh, obviously false, uh, uh, in the newspaper, if I say you are wearing a black jacket, well, in fact, you're wearing a, a lovely white or cream jacket. If I say it's a black jacket or an, and that you got it from slave labor, if I say that in a newspaper, you could take me to court. And because I know you could take me to court, I won't say it. And indeed, I'm sure it was a lovely jacket, well made. Um, I, on Twitter, I can say whatever I want, or on Facebook, within reason, sorry, uh, Facebook has some controls, but not that strong, you can get away with this. So when newspapers first began, they were as bad as Twitter and Facebook. There were no or minimal legal restrictions against them. It was a new technology, 1800s, late 1800s, and there was terrible, scurrilous uh, false charges in them. But we gradually developed a legal system to control it. And now newspapers can go wrong, but within reason, they, they fit, they're moderated, uh, they're, they're limited, our, our decent controls are there. Think of uh, when telephones were first introduced. People would have to take the phone call at all time. Then you got answering machines, which sort of moderated and controlled it. Automobiles were first brought in without seat belts and in some places without good controls over uh, drivers. You could just drive a car when you were old enough or tall enough. And we got in rules of the road and safety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So our new technologies, especially social media, don't have those controls yet. So it's not that the technology itself is terrible, but it always takes a while. First you have the technology, then people say, this isn't good, it's going too far, Let's, what are the controls that can make it work? You might even say, we're developing systems of compliance for our technologies. So would you say that there's a particular industry that's a breeding ground for meanness? Is the finance industry perhaps more prone to misconduct or the garment industry? Are, are there particular industries that are more prone to meanness, unfairness? I, I think in human nature, uh, almost any industry or any field can bring out arrogance. Um, and um, as our previous speaker mentioned, a lot of the times it's controlled from the top. Uh, so there's some hospitals have a really decent ethos that even if you're really busy as a surgeon or a medic or any other doctor, you have to treat your patients as human beings, pay attention to them, listen to them. Also, some hospitals have an ethos that the nurses, the educated nurses, are also to be treated as human beings, and they have a lot of wisdom. They have a lot of practical experience dealing with patients. And also, a nurse can often get a little indication of what might be wrong in the way that a parent, usually the mother, but it can be the father, can notice if something's going a little bit wrong with the child early on before anybody else. In a hospital like that, and I describe cases like that, um, it's actually better to be a patient in that hospital. It's also more pleasant to work there. There's other hospitals that have a totally different ethos where you're taught from the top, I'm a senior surgeon, I don't have to pay attention to you. And I describe a, a, in the book a case where there was a very minor operation on a woman and it began to go wrong and the surgeons didn't realize, the surgeons and the people doing the uh, anesthetics didn't realize uh, that the person, the lady on the table wasn't breathing. They were doing all sorts of other stuff and her oxygen saturation levels were going down, down, down. The nurses saw that. They tried to speak up. The surgeons just glared at them. I'm a superior human being. And as a result, though, the poor lady died. In that particular case, the husband of the woman who died had been in aviation. He was a pilot in Britain. And in Britain, they have, they've understood these terrible problems uh, of uh, an arrogant captain ignoring people around him. And one of the rules in uh, aviation almost around the world, I think it began in Scandinavia and Britain, but it spread to many other countries. Before a crew fly, uh, everybody has to speak to everybody else at least once. The, the head steward or the air hostess and the co-pilots and the flight engineers, they all have to say a few sentences. And it turns out, it could be about the most banal stuff, but that means when there is a problem in the air, if somebody says, ooh, there's something wrong with the wing coming uh, back, I want to inform you about it, you don't have the obstacle of starting from zero. You've already chatted a bit with the person. Kind of an informal, could be going out for beers, or in lovely Bavaria, could be going out for a walk in these lovely mountains which are so close to us. And that breaks down the barriers. We need to do this because people delude themselves. There was a great study I found in the book where um, uh, they asked a bunch of surgeons in America, 
uh, if there was good communication in their operating theater. And something like 85% said, oh yeah, I, we really listen. Mm -hmm. And they asked the nurses with those same surgeons, and about 18% said, yeah, they really listen. The rest didn't. The poor surgeon was deluded. So are you saying that the fine art of small talk is a protection against misconduct and unfairness? Correct. It, it can, Starting um, point. <laughs> yeah, so gossip is good. Yeah. Gossip opens up the levels of communication. Uh, we know that in a bullying organization, when there's a dictator or even a mini dictator in a company or even in a family, that dictator is the last person to know what's really going on because everybody below is scared of them. You can't give bad news to the boss. He'll yell at you and scream at you, and you'll only get promoted if you give good news. So as a result, as a result that person is blinded. When Saddam Hussein uh, ran Iraq, uh, he thought that his army was going to be stronger than the Western Allies, the army of the Western Allies. Clearly it wasn't, and all his military people and his intelligence people knew that, but they were terrified to tell him. Uh, the, the man, Hussein, seemed genuinely startled that it wasn't what he thought it was. So are, is a purpose in an organization, let's say a charity, for example, does that protect against misconduct and meanness? Uh, when I was young, I believed that. <laughs> I really thought if I could find the right field, I'd be surrounded by good people. Now, it's true that there are some organizations that are uh, better than others. So the villains in the James Bond films, you kind of assume their human resource practices are not magnificent. They use a lot of pistol shots to the head. So that's, it's quick, you know, and it saves a certain amount of time, but there's a disposal problem, and it can be terribly messy with splatter and also the laundering and detergent requirements afterwards. So I wouldn't go as far as a Smirsh or those organizations. In general, though, there's no perfection. Um, uh, Bertrand Russell, the great British philosopher who got the Nobel Prize, uh, he once wrote an essay called On the Ferocity of Vegetarians. So even somebody dealing with what you think might be a really nice cause, uh, vegetarianism, which has many great advantages these, today, these days, ethically and for the environment, somebody can become a fanatic about it. They can be mean, they can be aggressive. Uh, ESG, environmental and social and governance issues, are really good to, to get straight, but again, You'll get people who try to manipulate the system and pretend that a company has these standards, you know, the famous greenwashing and stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can have, even in a sensibly good organization, you can have manipulative people. Um, and clearly in, uh, in organizations that are just in there for the money, that can ha happen also. That's why, oh, so, go ahead. Sorry, and is, is there the problem, l a lack of listening, which is one uh, feedback. Of Chapters, um, yeah. Yes, totally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, one of the things I talk about is you can be generous to people, you can have a good goal, but you have to audit them. Mm -hmm. uh, and if somebody has nothing to hide, the auditing is, is fine. I, one of the chapters I talk about, the creation of the Empire State Building. Yes, I was going to ask you just about that one, because I think that's great from a compliance point of view. It's a very clear yeah. compliance and audit yeah. process. But yes, do tell us about that story. 1928 yeah. in New York City in Midtown, there was a great big famous hotel called the, the Old Waldorf Astoria. Um, 13 months later, that hotel had been taken down Financing and architectural designs had been uh, put together from scratch, and the tallest building in the world at the time, I think the tallest building for the next 40, 50 years, was built in 13 months from beginning to end. I have a leak in a second bedroom in my house in North London, which I've been worrying about <laughs> for more than 13 months. We've had guys come in. This was an incredible building, so how did they do it? Yeah. Well, the contractors were five, uh, a bunch of brothers from the Midwest, I'm from the American Midwest, so I'm very proud of the Midwest. And they decided to do two things. Uh, the first one seems obviously part of the book. They gave really good working conditions. They gave good salaries. If it was super windy, you didn't have to go out on exposed beams. Uh, they built uh, uh, cafeterias with really subsidized, good quality food at the various levels as the building was going up. So they were treating the workers really well. And they expected, well, what did they expect? They had a realism. If you work in the construction industry, you're very realistic about human beings. And that's the second thing they did. They were generous, but generosity alone means people will take advantage of you. People will think, you know what? Those Midwestern contractors, they're sort of hicks. We don't have to really work. They're being generous. So instead, they brought in auditors. Now, we think of auditors as people with a good mathematical background who are good at typing and send little cubicles. 
1929 in New York City, the auditors have to have good shoulders, like our, uh, uh, like our yoga lady this morning. They, they were about 80 or 100 or 120. They had to climb through the developing uh, skeleton of the Empire State Building twice each day, going to every worker on every floor, just checking, hey, matey, just check what you're doing. How's it doing? Okay, right. If the foreman says there's 11 people here and they're using this equipment, let's just check, yeah, it's 11, that's good, right on, and then they go to the next person. With those auditors clambering around and getting terrific shoulders, if I might say so myself, um, if those, with those auditors doing it, there was no chance of cheating. And as a result, the worker said, you know what, they're paying us well, they're, being, they're keeping a good eye, we can't get away with anything. And because they are paying us well and treating us well, a wonderful thing came back. If you're mean to somebody, you know what you get back, you get resentment. If you're nice to somebody or fair to somebody, you often get generosity gratitude comes back. So the workers developed all sorts of interesting ways to move the bricks around. They developed a little spontaneous railroads, and um, it had this terrific quick result. So the, the second title of that chapter is Give But Audit. And I, Crucial. I think auditing is, or it seems to me from your book that it's a very important factor for good good conduct and fairness. Totally, we need that feedback. And, and your example is great because it's very placative. I mean, you can see them going around controlling and auditing all these things. But when we look into more complex industries, and now the Pandora papers have just broken, and we've got, was it, four terabytes of information, and it's just so incredibly complex. What would you suggest? How can you be fair in such a situation? You, most people don't even understand what it is and what's going on. It's very difficult to get behind and see the truth. One of the great things with uh, human civilization is our tools get better and better. So uh, before there were rules of, ar of arithmetic, you would just know the basics. There's three things and two things. They happen to be five. Once you know the rules of arithmetic, you can generate it all. Um, in the 16 and 1700s, things were really complicated until calculus and other tools came in. So we, we developed tools that encompass a lot of earlier stuff. If you understand the principles of uh, why people cheat, and uh, uh, tax, world tax authorities are really good at that, uh, the Pandora Papers revealed not just that there's uh, places where you can hide your money from taxation, it's most importantly, it's places where you can hide your money from laws. You can hide your money from any law. If you want to, uh, somebody wants to give money to a mistress or take money uh, out of a country or use money for a bribe, it can go there. Once you understand that, oh, I see, these basic human desires to sort of selfishly get whatever you want are going to be there, then our, uh, as regulators, our job is to just see, well, how can we channel those desires in a good way? If you want to uh, send your child to a university, how about either educate them properly or um, save for it, rather than put secret money aside to bribe them uh, from the side. So although there's many terabytes of information, if you understand the goals and the intentions of what people are doing, you have a way of finding out what's there. There was a great study a while ago of uh, chess players. If you show, a, show a, a, a chess board in the middle of a game to an average person like me, I don't play chess, it's like, it's kind of hard for me to remember. Mm -hmm. If you show it to Gary Kasparov, he's like instantly can remember it because there's a pattern there. If, however, you show a random chessboard with pieces in a random position, Gary Kasparov and myself will be similar because there's no pattern to it. Uh, a chess master sees patterns and finds it easy to remember. A good accountant will understand where manipulations are likely to be and will instantly see patterns in what to me might seem complex random information. Okay. Are there industries, do you think, are setting new standards in fairness? It's a great question. Do we have hope? <laughs> yeah. I, I would say um, uh, a lot of young people, um, uh, a lot of young people today, they know that they can get by in a really limited life. You can stay at home with Netflix and your computer, and they don't want to do that. So kids, in theory, uh, in their early 20s, they could live in their bedrooms or studies, but they prefer to live in cool cities. They, they like to come into Munich or into Berlin or uh, parts of New York or London. They want to be around other people. They, 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 want to, they want to be there or make things happen. And in particular, they want to find meaning. Everybody does. But young people feel, gosh, do I really want to go around and do things without meaning? So as a result of that, I think uh, there's a number of newish fields, uh, fields that are being created now, which draw people 
where although there will be uh, people who lie and cheat, the majority of people in those fields don't want that. So think of the supply chains. We were talking about jackets. When I bought this jacket a number of years ago, I didn't pay any attention to where it came from. Uh, there's groups now who will, can tell me where the cotton came from, they can source it, they can use our computer technology really well, and you can find out, was it ethically developed? I'm totally happy to pay a small premium for that, and the people who are working in those fields, I found, are really energetic, they're committed. So yes, they might be rude or impolite to other people in their company, but if they are, you can call it to their account and say, well, I shouldn't be. I'm trying to make something ethically good as a product. I want to have meaning in my life. I don't want to be the sort of person who, along with the goal of my company, yells and screams at the people around me. Why can't I be as decent in my, circul in my uh, local circle as, uh, as I am with the product of my company? So I think in answer to your question, I think a number of new fields, a, a number of things in the ESG field, in clean energy and uh, uh, supply chains, in the circular economy, people, they start out wanting good stuff. If there's a crummy boss and there's terrible financial incentives, they can go off in the wrong direction and become yelling and bullying. But if they do, you have all these uh, um, problems. The, um, if you comply to good principles, everything's easier. Uh, you, if you're honest and you listen and you get feedback, you get accurate information what's going on. If you try not to cheat the people around you, as I point out in the book, you get gratitude coming back rather than resentment. And if you're genuinely open to what the outside world might have to offer, including some of the intelligent people who made this legislation, if you think of the, legisla the legislators as the enemy, then you'll sort of block and you won't learn anything from them. But if you're, if you're open to them and think, you know, some of them have good points, then you can learn from them, you can get alliances. Uh, one of the examples I talk about in the book is Microsoft yes. under uh, Nadella. Mm -hmm. uh, the man who was head of Microsoft before Nadella, um, uh, not everybody would say he was the gentlest human being on earth. And in particular, he didn't have an attitude of listening to the outside world. It was like he defended his company, but he perhaps over-defended. He had many other skills. He was a brilliant man, I think better at mathematics at Harvard than Bill Gates. So he was, he was a bright boy, but he could be a little bit uh, strong about defending the company. Nadella had a much greater modesty. He'd overcome great uh, personal adversity in his own life, in his own family, which I talk about in the book, and he thought, you know what? Maybe there is wisdom from outside. This doesn't mean you, you can be soft. A company like Microsoft doesn't get to be where it is without lawyers to defend themselves, without being aware there's going to be ridiculous lawsuits against them. Uh, but if you have an attitude that there's nothing to learn from outside, you won't open up to open source, you won't move into the cloud, you won't do all these new things that uh, wisdom and connection from outsiders can give you. Basically, if you're a little bit modest and have a little bit of decency, the world can help you. Well, but one of the chapters that is not so inspiring from, from the point of view of wanting to be fair and do good is the chapter about William Bly. I love him. The captain of a Mutiny on the Bounty. Um, now, he was really trying to do good and had all sorts of good principles and um, good techniques as well to, to deal with his team. But what's a little bit disheartening is also the statistic you give, what was it, is it that 5% of people only want, will actually do good no matter what the circumstances are? It, yeah. And the rest are sort of pretty wishy-washy depending on the circumstance. I, I, you've totally nailed it. Uh, so the statistics are, are variable. Different people give different estimates. But we kind of know from our personal experience, there's a few people who will always do the decent thing. If nobody's around, they'll still be act the right way. In Britain, they talk about the queue of one person lining up for a bus st stop, even if nobody's looking, still doing the decent thing. Or people who are fair if uh, you can, I don't know, sometimes in rural areas, farmers might leave, um, uh, say, food out, like uh, eggs, and they trust you to leave money in a box. And some people, they'll always leave the money in the box. And so that's, I don't know what percent, 5%, 10%, it's, it's a small number. Now there's a certain percentage of people in society who will never leave money in the box, who will always try to take advantage. Uh, God forbid you've had to work with them. We, we know what those people are like. In some countries, they've been elected to high political office. Um, so we, uh, a society can never exist if there's 100% of people like that. It falls apart. But these are freeloaders who will take advantage. There's always a few of those. And as you point out, most of us, we're human beings. We're in between 70%, 80%, 90%. It's hard to tell. And if it's to our 
uh, great, if it's absolutely crucial to be selfish, uh, if you're drowning or like there's only three slots out of a, a country where there's like earthquakes or fires, people can be forced to be very selfish. Uh, the Squid Games on uh, Netflix, the super popular series, uh, demonstrates what can happen when people are under great pressure. The good thing that legislators can do, the good thing that companies and compliance officers can do, is put us in a setting where we don't have to be like that. And if you don't have to be like that, most people will end up being quite reasonable. You kind of want to apply the golden rule. You mentioned William Bly. He was a famous British sea captain in the 1700s. He had a ship called the Bounty and there was a mutiny against him. Turned out, William Bly had four mutinies against him. This was only one of the mutinies against him. But his intentions were incredible well, see, and actually for the time, very forward thinking, very modern. So totally. what went wrong? So what went wrong, <laughs> and this is what's frustrating. So, you know, some people are, are saintly, like, I don't know, Nelson Mandela are excellent people, even though he was a good boxer when he was younger. Uh, so many people are in the middle. Some people are basically jerks. Um, there's just no getting around it. So William Bly was basically a jerk, but he didn't want to be. He really, really, really didn't want to be, and he tried so hard to keep his temper under control. And when things were going well, he was like that. When he was sailing from England uh, all the way to Tahiti uh, with his men in the 1780s, uh, when their feet got wet, he would give away his cabin so they could sit there and dry their feet at, 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 the, at, at the furnace mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. He was decent. He had music being played. He tried to educate the people. He said flogging them with a whip, common in the uh, Navy then, was a terrible, vulgar thing to do. He really tried to be rational. And if everything was going okay, it was fine. If you ever met somebody with a, basically a bad temper, if you appease them, if everything's fine, everything's nice and there's good food and nothing's going wrong, they stay nice. But the moment there's a problem, they're not resilient. They're not resilient. And William Bly was a person like that. He was in the unfortunate 5%. And so the moment his men landed in Tahiti and thought, do you know what? I have a choice between going back to the slums of London or living like a god in Tahiti. I'm gonna to try to stay here and not be active on the ship. He got furious, we have to go back on the ship and stuff. Um, but actually because his purpose was good, he wanted to do something yes. great for mankind. Right? Totally, yeah. totally, and so he would pay no attention to anything else. Some people who have a bad temper, if you can get to uh, speak to them or understand them, they often get a bad temper because they're frustrated. Uh, parents will often do that with a child. If a parent yells at a child, which really shouldn't be done, afterwards the parent might feel guilty, but they'll say, I really, I just wanted to have a nice day in the park, and the kid was driving me nuts about this and that. Or in a couple, in a relationship, if people act uh, rudely or, uh, or, or angrily and stuff, they'll often later say, but it was so frustrating. I just wanted to, to meet, or I wanted to be listened to, or I wanted mm -hmm. to treat him or her to a nice occasion. Frustration gets in the way. But is the problem there also perhaps with William Bly and hopefully perhaps relatable to business that too much of a focus on a purpose, a particular outcome is a problem? I mean, because you need drive and you need a goal. But he was frustrated because he only had the one goal and, and couldn't adapt that. You've totally nailed it. So think of the person who destroys a picnic because, uh, or we're going to go hiking in the mountains. Um, and, but, and, you know, to be there at a good time, we want to leave the house at 8 o'clock. Now, if that person uh, has to leave the house at 8.05, a normal person will say, that's fine. Our, what's our goal? Our goal is to have a good day in the mountains. But a fanatic will say, but we said 8 o'clock, and they start yelling and screaming that you're not leaving at 8 o'clock, you're leaving at 8.05. So that, that's, I suppose, an example of what you said about purpose. If you are aware of the purpose, and get stuck on the minutia of how to get there, that's kind of unpleasant. If you think, it, what is the purpose? Is the purpose to have a meaningful company? Is the purpose to do good works? Is the purpose to make a profit, but in a, in a good and a, a, a sustainable way? Then you won't freak out at little things along the way. You might have to be firm about it. Um, uh, as we know, you don't have to uh, love your boss to respect them. You don't even have to like them. It's good if you like them, but you don't have to. But if they're fair, and they, they basically tell the truth and they're competent, we really respond well to them. Uh, poor William Bly. <laughs> yes, what did he, so what went wrong yeah. with him exactly? So I wanted to get back to that what story What he should as well, have done yeah. is he should have been, he's the sort of person who should have been a quiet uh, mathematician uh, with tenure and he wouldn't have to deal with any human beings. He should have been Isaac Newton. In fact, he revered Isaac Newton, who uh, lived a century before him, who was a man with a terrible temper. 
Uh, but when he was allowed to be a quiet uh, a researcher at Cambridge University, he was okay because nothing was wrong. Uh, some people can deal with uh, adversity. You stub your toe and like, I don't know, you, you get upset, but you don't get terribly upset. Other people, they're on the knife edge. They're on the edge of frustration all the time. They stub their toe and say, well, that's it. Oh, for goodness sake. They get so furious. People like that, they need to be in a really safe, limited environment. Uh, they should not be let out. They certainly shouldn't be <laughs> captain of 60 or 70 people sailing across the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so for businesses, uh, asking the right questions in recruitment is probably the key learning of this, right? Find the right sort of person. Some people are really resilient. They're the perfect managers when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. You see them as many junior officers in the army or uh, a, a good sort of factory foreman, not, not a bossy one. They're, they're used to adversity, they handle it well. People from big families, I found, work really well like that. They know that things are kind mm -hmm. of messy and go mm -hmm. wrong. Um, there's other people who might be wonderful in a certain setting, but they're not resilient. Keep them in the back room, possibly in the basement. Did you ever see the film Armageddon? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, no, um, uh, yeah, that's it, where these aliens come to Earth and there's a secret military base in, uh, in Nevada. That's where and they should go. It, well, uh, <laughs> the the, there's leave. all these nerdy guys working in the secret military base mm -hmm. and the hero uh, goes down and says, oh, we, ha we haven't heard about you. And the people in the secret military base who are extreme nerds, William Bly types, they say, they don't let us out very much. <laughs> <laughs> there's some people like that who play a really good role and they should stay in that role. Okay. Um, what would you say are the key indicators of success in the art of fairness? How do you measure success? How do you know that you're doing, doing something right in the art of fairness? Um, this is hard because if you're a bully, and especially if you have power, nobody will tell you the truth. Uh, Aristotle, over 2,000 years ago, said that rich people think they're smart because smart people sit at their feet. Uh, as, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Who's going to tell them the truth? So what's an objective indicator? An objective indicator is that information is flowing honestly through the organization, including you, the boss, if you are the boss, receiving bad information, receiving unpleasant information, or if you're the underling, knowing that you can send the information there. If there's no information transfers like that, somebody has their ego a little bit too strong, they're blocking it. So that's one indicator. The other one is that issue I was talking about gratitude. If there's no generous giving within an organization, you won't get gratitude flying back. Again, if you've ever been in a poisonous organization or seen a couple who say, I don't know what's happening on that side of the house, it's not my obligation, that's very unpleasant. And you can tell there's no gratitude coming back. And in particular, there's very little creativity coming up. Nobody is willing to go the extra mile. Now remember, you need the practical rule. You have to audit, you can't go too far. But you, um, if there's no gratitude, if there's no generosity or creativity moving along, something else is wrong. And then the third thing is where you set the boundaries, the uh, defending. There's a famous line from American Baseball, nice guys finish last. And the uh, manager who came up with that line, Leo DeRocher, he himself finished last. He was a failure because he was so brutal against outsiders that he couldn't learn from them and they turned against him. If you are a little bit more open to outsiders, not weak, you don't want to be walked over, but if you're a little bit open, you find you get alliances. And if you, to, as you ask the question, how can you tell if you're uh, doing these decent things. If there's good information flow, if there's creativity, and also if occasionally you cross the boundaries and find people from outside are willing to work with you and that you gain from that, that's another good indicator. That was the example you give with Nadella, that he really opened up Microsoft for partnerships and actually brought in the competitors to, to work with them, right? Yeah, and, okay. you, a, 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 and that way you learn. Okay. Um, what would you say in a nutshell for our compliance audience and ethics audience is the message of your book? Oh, it, it, if you buy large copies of this book, you turns out you get rewarded on Christmas morning. <laughs> oh, sorry, is that not true? I'm just teasing. Yes. Buy the book. Oh, funny you yeah. should bring that up. Yeah. Um, the, message, the message is that fairness has remarkable properties. Many people think that being fair or being decent it's an extra obligation. I have to do this, I have to do that. Oh, for goodness sake, I'm not supposed to scream at people. That's so much to ask. On the contrary, you can flip it around and say, you know what, if I'm being decent or fair, I'll get all these great strengths. There'll be wonderful information flow, there'll be creativity, and there's the chance of alliances coming back. Uh, when I was younger, I learned French as a young adult. I was like 20, 21 in Paris. And I remember when I was first learning French, I did it really badly. I tried to do it in terms of English sentences. And it was hard. Everything was sort of clumsy. That's sort of like a company that always cheats on invoices and doesn't do things fairly. After a while, I relaxed into it. 
I, met, I was doing some teaching in France. I met French friends, a lovely French partner. And, and I found that if I actually relaxed and let myself speak French the proper way, uh, the syntax carried me along in a really pleasant and easy stream. It was easier in that case to go with the correct way of acting than the opposite. If you have a company where everybody, think of a company where you don't pay your invoices on time. Well, you always have to re uh, remember, what lies did I give people about why I'm late? You never know what your real cash is. Suppose you have a company, this is a super simple example, where you pay everybody on time. You instantly know wh where your cash is. Uh, you don't have to keep a series of lies going. So I suppose <clears throat> being decent can be its own reward. It sounds like relax and go with the flow is <laughs> the message. Okay. What future projects do you have? I am writing a book as we speak. I'm two thirds of the way through of a book on resets uh, based on a, a Financial Times article I did last year. I, I did a bunch of articles and this one got a lot of feedback. Everybody says they want to reset their life with the pandemic. You want to reset your country or your company. Mm -hmm. And almost all goals like that fall apart. January 1st, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to look like that great yoga teacher earlier and stuff. January 15th or 20th, well, I can't be bothered to go to the gym. You know, everybody makes these goals to reset, and it usually doesn't work. However, there have been a few times in history where big resets have worked, where countries have reconfigured themselves for better, where human beings, we ourselves, at times we make our own personalities better. How do we do it? So I'm just giving three case studies and showing how people did it so we can learn from it. It should be out maybe in two years. First, I merely have to finish writing it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us here in Munich in the studio. It's been lovely to talk to you, David Bordanis. Thank you.